I believe I've got a slightly different perspective of perspective of the world than a lot of people and I think a lot of that comes down to trying to be as realistic as possible um, and not and trying to not listen to general biases so general societal beliefs tend to um, mislead the public and, and that's that's something that is very obvious when you look at history when you look at history in any country at any period of time the public are nearly always misled I mean a lot of people complain that you know this time it's you know we've never had it this bad or never had it this good etc so the way I approach life these days is that for as long as we're alive in any point in history governments don't you know governments will will not care about you okay don't prices will always be too high taxes will always seem like they're too high or taxes will always increase m2 will always increase um, the, the world is not fair world not fair um, the there will always be um, billionaire psychopaths and for the newer members I did a, a pretty I did a trading pub a long time ago where I was trying to show you all that if you took the the, the standard distribution of of all humans on the planet so all eight billion people most people will be within two sigma of normality and uh, and there will be you know so if you did it like this in terms of wealth right everyone is here so most of the world is basically here but then you'll have a whole bunch of people over here which are billionaires then if you've got a magnifying glass on those billionaires um, and then did a another chart of or actually a straight line of let's say not psychopath and extreme psycho or another way you could put it is good people and bad people or evil etc it's going to be something like this and so what we worked out is that if you took you know the the furthest extreme so proper psychos that you don't look at society with a normal lens and that you know bad is a diff good and bad is a is a construct which they don't really you know um doesn't they don't look at it like you know a normal person does and when you take that and this there are going to be at least a, you know probably i can't remember the number but it was over a thousand uh center millionaires and at least a handful of billionaires so if you have a handful of billionaires and at least a thousand centi millionaires so 100 million dollar net worth or more you know you have a huge amount of wealth and things that these psycho psychopath billionaires would do which you know the, the world wouldn't really think of, think you know would be shocked but the thing is this is nothing new this is just humans humans haven't changed so when I look at the world I, I look at everything like it's a computer game and so this is a computer game called life and these are the starting parameters you get um, you know you load the game into a certain nuclear nu <laughs> like a certain family in a certain country and the object of the game is to do as best as you can in whatever niche that you want to do over your 80 year 100 year period and then that's it and these are just parts of the game um, so that's how I look at the world that okay so all of this is normal this is not you know nothing is egregious here we have to just accept governments don't care about us they care about votes prices and taxes and M2 will always go up world just isn't fair and there will always be billionaire psychopaths that look at the the general populace as livestock and not humans and so when you have that mental model of the world yes it does sound like you're a bit of a pessimist and that you know oh my god you're, you're looking at this in a very doom, gloom and doomy way but I don't, I don't see it like that for me this is just normality and then you have to look at things 
differently. Now, going back to the actual topic here, which is becoming a good, a better trader, for me, the thing that's really helped um, is that looking at patterns and charts is great for trading, but you also need to be aware of patterns in the real world itself. And so when I look at patterns in the real world, I see, and history, so I, I'm a, like a, I love watching history uh, ch uh, channels and stuff like that. Um, the, it, it just fascinates me because things that the Romans did are things that the US are doing. You know, uh, it, 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 there's so many um, parallels here. And one of the things is that I, the, the road to serfdom and enslavement is, I'm going to actually type it, it will be a lot quicker. Um, um, so let's do this, road to enslavement slash serfdom, is that how I spell serfdom? Uh, <clears throat> There is a, a specific trick that governments do, or not just government. It could be in the past. It's always been a dictator of some sort, but these days, because we're ha we're going through this experiment of democracy, and democracy is only something like two hundred years old. Um, it's, so it is an experiment. Um, we have let's do a different color. There's a certain pattern. Oh, screw it, I'll just write it. I'm, it's hard going from text to writing, I'll just write it. Um, so, what happens is the, the government will give some someone something, okay? So, there will be a handout. So, let's say, gov handout. Okay, and what that garners in the populace is appreciation. Appreciation. So, it's like, ah! Okay, uh, that, that's pretty cool. Thanks for the handout. Whether it be welfare or pensions, like the Liberal government in 1909 in the UK first invented the the pension, and they're like, oh, and that for that was just a, a vote winner because the the equivalent age of those that ha were entitled to pensions were the equivalent of 112 years old in, in today's ages when you uh, um, account for mortality rates and stuff like that and, and long, longevity. So they knew that barely anyone, anyone would get a pension, but it was, you know, pretty, pretty cool sort of trick. So what happens, government handouts, they lead to appreciation. But then if you do it a couple of times, guess what? That appreciation turns into anticipation. And <clears throat> that anticipation turns into expectance. And that expectance may be on the same line, but it's basically, it breeds entitlement. Entitlement. And it, obviously it depends how the government's going ahead with this, but if they continue to do these little handouts etc what then happens is the government breeds dependence dependence and once you have a populace which is completely dependent on you and your handouts you then have the the ultimate thing that they want they have compliance right this is the playbook that has been done for thousands of years across the world now do you see any similarities to these days? And I mean, yeah, we had all the handouts with COVID, all that sort of stuff. So what's happened is that literally in the last three years, the world governments have taken the global population from basically here to here, or these two parts, in the space of like three years. But it's not total compliance just yet okay so here's the pattern so we've gone from up here to you know dependence and slash compliance at the moment with you know the jabs and all that sort of stuff and uh, and whatnot but they, they haven't got total compliance just yet any guesses what the the last trick in the playbook is to get total compliance across most of the the g20 nations 
BBDC. There we go, Chris, spot on, and I'm glad you, yeah, spot on. CBDCs, CBDCs is the last playbook. That is the last trick in their sleeves to get total compliance, because CBD. Oh, actually, no, it's not the last. Um, the last part, that, that the CBDCs are simply an enabler for further total compliance. It's an, an uh, it's an enabler because the eventual goal it, are stuff like climate lockdowns. Basically, turn us into China. Exactly, it's basically modern day China, and I've said this endless times: modern day China. And so there's so there's climate lockdowns. There's so UBI will be linked to a CBDC. Um, there'll be some sort of social credit or carbon credit score. Carbon, let's say, at slash social, uh, social, I can't spell today, social credit score. Let's just do it like that. So this, this is where total compliance is. And one thing I've been absolutely hor horrified at watching at the moment is the Netherlands. So the Netherlands are the, the, I think, the second biggest food exporter on the planet. Um, and what's happened is that the, the, due to the WEF, the World Economic Forum, and all these ESG uh, bullshit things that are coming out, the government in, in the Netherlands have force bought, what was it, it's either 3,000 or 30,000 farms. One second. Uh, how many farms have the Dutch government bought since 2022 because what happened I think off the top of my head they bought 3,000 farms and shut them all down uh, okay there uh, okay I have to double check Bard because it uh, but the battery have not yet begun um, ba -ba -ba -ba. this doesn't so 3,000 farms one second because if you've been following with um, that was November paid to buy up and close down 3,000 farms because there's, there's lots of riots going on in the Netherlands uh, so okay so it hasn't attempted to push on and shut hundreds of farms to cut nitrogen oxide emissions Okay, I need to look at this again. I'll come back to you once I've got all the facts and figures properly. Um, but yeah, the and here's the thing: when you tie this in with the, the the thing that I started with, with what is an economy, and and also um, what are the world's top three food exporters? So either the Netherlands are the second or third. Jesus. Okay, the fourth. Uh, uh, let me Google that. Germany. I could have sworn it was Netherlands. Okay, the sixth there. Okay, so my, my figures may have been wrong, but I swear when we did the trading pub last time, I found websites that said they were the second or third. Anyway, they're a big exporter in the world. So what happens when the government finally buys and force buys those 3,000 farms and shuts them down? Well, you then go back to this whole economy thing. You have a whole bunch of farms that shut down. All of a sudden, you, you cause havoc in the supply chain. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, just, it's just it's just nuts. And so, when you create shocks in the in the food in the food supply, guess what? You then you, you sort of force the public to buy other foods. Um, and so, uh, who was it? I can't remember who the originator of this quote because it has been sort of perpetuated over time. But it's how do you control people? You control the money and the food. That's it. Food and money supply is how you um, control people. And that's exactly what it looks like it's doing. So I see this this road to serfdom happening 
beyond before our very eyes and so so if this is the goal so this is where pattern recognition comes in so if this is the goal then what are the, the what are the triggers there's there's always so this is the process right so in terms of the pattern recognition all that I've just explained is the process or the inevitable outcome but what is, what are the triggers so there are always triggers as in things that happen that coax this process down the down down the line so the world has become very more even more centralized since covid so covid and slash the lockdowns was a trigger and what what has happened since then so if you just look at the the world health organization they have now got immense more way more power than they ever had done to the point where i think the last again i need to find the articles because i didn't want to talk about covid but most big countries are in the process of signing some sort of form to, to give way more power to the who so yeah it's just nuts so that's just one little thread if you pull on a thread so there's gonna be other triggers well guess what um, Bill Gates Warren Buffett and the WEF are now talking about two things two more more triggers coming down the line so they're both all three of them are talk saying that there's more COVID coming so more COVID so more bollocks to, to come soon with more masks more mandates more whatever and the thing that really scares me that genuinely scares me is that the world economic forum for the last two years now so once whilst everyone's preoccupied with covid klaus schwab himself the founder and the head of the world economic forum has been talking religiously about cyber covid i've mentioned this before and i don't want to go into this today but basically just google it yourself watch the actual videos from the WEF <laughs> there are World Economic Forum videos about this and basically whatever they say ends up happening and so Klaus was saying that a cyber COVID would make lockdowns and and COVID-19 look like a small blip compared to what cyber COVID would do because you'd have utter breakdowns in every every form of chain you could think of from supply chain to logistics to transport to energy all that sort of stuff and so to me that that actually makes sense to I know it sounds conspiratorial it sounds like tin hat time but when you have the mindset that all of this is normal up here and you have billionaire psychopaths that actually control the world and these billionaire psychopaths love doing this process because that's what humans have done throughout time and then when you look at all of this and go okay so eventually they want CBDCs to control and track everyone because they can't do climate change lockdowns and UBIs and all this bollocks until there is a CBDC so that, as I said that the CBDC is just the enabler well in order to get all of this to move a lot faster what needs to happen there needs to be triggers there has to be a trigger and there always are triggers you look at most things there's a trigger um, it's like yeah does anyone find it weird that <laughs> no no I'm going I don't want to yeah, I'll go too far if I, <laughs> I've got loads more things I want to say but then all of a sudden 90% of you will be like what the hell did he just say <laughs> so let's let's rein it back there so talking about pattern recognition it's not just in the charts it's into the normal world so like here's my crazy plan and by the way this mental model of the world has already protected me already in 2015 I sort of jumped off the cliff when it when I discovered the World Economic Forum and all that sort of stuff and guess what happened in 2015 to 2019 the WEF was talking endlessly about some sort of contagion that is imminent Bill Gates started jumping on it, you know, very early on, blah, blah, blah. And so I said to my wife years ago, I was, oh my God, what would happen if, you know, we had this and, you know, according to them, the world will go into pandemonium and all that sort of stuff. And so I then tried to de-risk de my life. So I always talk about your life orchestra. Well, I said to Ellie way back in the day, I was like, we need 
a resilient life orchestra. So what I then started doing is buying up shitloads of different companies. So I set up a private equity firm and part of the PE firm, we went and bought up a whole bunch of different businesses, not just the PE, me, myself as well, I bought a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and so before I knew it, in the space of, well, I, I was an idiot here because I think I bought 12 or 15 companies in two years, which was just absolutely stupid. But either way, I was effectively diversifying myself because I wasn't sure what, you know, I saw that something bad was happening um, and I wasn't sure what happened. So what happened in 2020, when we had the lockdowns and stuff, I had a whole bunch of businesses that went dead and I had some business that did all right. And so my personal income, my family was safe. And so the whole sort of de-risking of my life, my life orchestra actually worked. So moving forwards, the thing that I see, the, the bullet that's entering my peripheral vision right now, which no one is picking up on, is this, this horrible term that Klaus Schwab keeps talking about, cyber COVID. Well, what happens, the, I think almost the exact words are, the internet will have to shut down and re-emerge in, re in a different state. What the hell does that mean? It means they're gonna shut down the internet for I don't know how long, a day, a weekend, I don't know, and then a highly censored internet will pop up just like China has. <laughs> that way they can control the propagation of free speech and information even more. So how the hell do you protect yourself against cyber COVID? The honest answer is I don't know, but one thing I am doing is I want I, I, I want to create and set up a wholesale, wholesale food business not to make profits but to br to wash its face to, just to break even but basically this will be full of non-perishable foods non-perishable foods so this will be a wholesaler that specializes in water rice pasta um, all the stuff where yeah non-perishable I guess so I'd like it to break even. I'd like to have not one, but a couple of warehouses filled to the brim of water, rice, pasta, and all that sort of stuff. And sell it, yeah, to shops, you know, supermarkets, whatever, just, you know, just so it washes its face. But for me, this is my insurance policy. Because what will happen, insurance, because if cyber COVID hits, guess what? Every business I have goes in the, into the drain just like the, in fact all world businesses basically stop and I, I don't want to be dependent on anyone and therefore this is my little insurance business where I'll have some in some cash flow if there is another you know COVID type thing guess what food providers are allowed to stay open so I learned my lesson during the first bunch of lockdowns um, so that and then I guess <clears throat> where does cyber COVID fit with crypto this is, this is the other thing like <clears throat> you may think oh Simon's such an idiot it's such a conspiracy theorist but I all I'm looking at is that my part of being a good investor is having I say this a lot you have to have a crystal clear focus and clarity about your core basket of stuff and then you need a fuzzy peripheral vision so you need to know a little bit about a lot so if there is some arrow that's heading towards your basket, you need to be able to, to pivot. So I'm constantly paranoid about this arrow, which is the WEF coming in to screw up my shit, basically. So, oh, so Migs, did you say something? Yeah, I was just saying that if that cyber COVID does hit, that means cryptos are going to all fall flat because if they're censoring everything, they can tell it's all of a sudden your Bitcoin, you've got no more access to Bitcoin because that part of the internet's cut out. That was one of my thoughts, but I mean, this internet still exists. Like, let's say you're in China. China's blocked the internet as we know it. China, the internet in China is very different than what we experience, but it doesn't, you know, it, it still exists. You can't just kill Bitcoin like that. Um, so, and one thing I've learned throughout history is that any time a government or an organization has tried to ban something, that banned thing grow, grows in price a lot harder. If there are CBDCs, or not if, when there are CBDCs launching, that will only help people flow into Bitcoin. 
Um, and then, yeah. Another thing is with Elon satellites. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure if Elon satellites would be affected by, like, if they if if they decide to censor it because that, I think there's a massive mine somewhere in the ocean where all the internet hubs are. So that's the, that that'll be the ideal striking place. But if it's up if it's up in the sky with Elon's um, satellites, they can't touch them. Starlink is completely separate to the the terrestrial sat, um, internet um, supply chain, so to speak. And don't you think if I'm thinking like this, don't you think Elon has thought of risk mitigation and stuff like that? Like, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Elon has had similar thoughts and gone shit. Okay, I need my own internet so I, I can't be shut off and I need, guess what, a broadcasting place where I can disseminate free, you know, the, the truth, the real news. You know, why else would he buy Twitter for 54 billion or, or however much it was? Like, he is insulating himself from everything, basically. Hell, so much so that he's, <laughs> he's trying to get to Mars. Like, so, yeah, so I... What can we do as modern day plebs? You and I, we are just the retail pleb plebeians. Um, so we can either, you know, you can be as extreme as I am and try and set up some sort of non internet related lockdown proof business. So I saw in lockdowns that food businesses were allowed to stay open. So I want some sort of food business. Um, something which gives me an income uh, if, if if you know like RT is probably the first thing that will die you know if <laughs> if something like this happens um, so yeah and also crypto I think that this is why I'm trying to offload and uh, or this is my opinion and you could disagree with it and it would be completely valid if you do disagree with it but choke point two point zero is out right now their, their banks are blocking off as many on and off ramps as they can to the point I've got one on and off ramp that's it the moment Santander shuts off my off ramp to Kraken my corporate Kraken account I am absolutely buggered um, so I'm, I'm lo always looking for new on and off ramps good ones you know reliable ones but as the closer we get to CBDCs the harder it will be to convert your pound sterling or your dollars wherever you are in the world into crypto so this is why I want to off-ramp as much fiat as possible right now before that becomes much of an issue so in that I think personally I've already ticked that box alright so I'm not too fussed anymore so even if I lose an off-ramp I'm fine I've got basically money stored offshore so you remember when I talk about uh, Argentinians that I did a whole bunch of presentations ye uh, a couple of years ago where I went through where is it sorry it's the other one no nope, wrong one USD cars and then we look at the daily chart so this is Argentina the US dollar against Ar or Ar the peso against US dollar so it's 350 pesos to the dollar one for those that can remember it, the the solution for the average Argentine back then was, or at any point really in his in, in the past here, is to um, borrow as much as you can in and, and get as many dollars as you can, and then you have to store those dollars offshore. And there were a whole bunch of people that did all the right things, but they stored the dollars in Argentinian banks, and guess what? They lost their dollars. So. The, what's happening here with Argentina in the world is exactly what's going to happen with Bitcoin in the world. So, or, or sorry, your 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 own fiat currency. So the pound sterling. So you need to store, get as much, you know, convert your pounds into Bitcoin as much as you can, and then store your Bitcoin offshore. And the way to do that is basically in your own wallet, not on an exchange, all that sort of chisel. Um, you get that. I've talked about this a lot. So. Um, so for me, it's yeah, it's just businesses, um, and crypto, and that is my focus. And at the moment, the only thing that's putting a spanner in the works is is the World Economic Forum.